So very quickly, what we're going to show on the demo, we're actually going to walk you through uh, managing of a system, how you can operationally manage it. You're going to see how we manage nodes, how we manage data centers. You're going to see some of the different options. You're going to see quality of service. You're going to see a lot of that. And we're going to go through it in an amazingly short length of time. So we're going to see if we can do a six minute demo. Uh, I got rid of my jacket, so I'm now in my techie look. So very quickly, what you're seeing here, this is a front dashboard. This is the running cluster that we have running. You can see the current capacity st managed across the cluster, right? So over here, you also see whether the cur cluster is currently healthy. There aren't any alerts on it, so this is good to see. You're seeing the transactional I.O. across the cluster, uh, any of the put data. So a very simple dashboard that shows you everything that's going on in the cluster. You also then have the entities that are managed. So let's drill into some of those really quickly. Uh, so Victor, as as storage admin, if you can drill into the groups manage side of things. So here I'm going to list the groups, right? I see the properties of or the attributes of each group. I could assign QoS settings and also make a a setting that will be global, and I could create new groups at this state. And if you look. Look at the property of the the group here. I could set some of the limits for storage quotas, uh, rates of transfer. I could also associate a particular group to a rating plan, uh, right? I could create one. Uh, the way to do that, I just click on a rating plan here. Uh, create one. And a rating plan is where I define uh, pricing associated with a resource, such as uh, storage or rates, right? Such as these listed here. Uh, so the main goal of this is to keep the system highly multi-tenanted. You've got different groups who are using the system. You've got to make sure the groups, it's fair across groups. We're not having abuse. But also we want very detailed accounting and so that we can actually get some, a lot of customers of ours don't do chargeback, you know, service providers particularly do, but they do want to see this level of auditing where they can actually see what's going on in the system uh, and how are different groups using it. And so we build it very easily. The different rating plans is kind of interesting. It comes to our background. Our background is from working with big service providers like NTT in Japan and Nifty who are two of our early customers, uh, really building this in as a true cloud service. So as we drill into this, maybe another thing to kind of quickly look at, let's have a look at the capacity view. I mean, just drill down to what Vikram was showing earlier. Right, so uh, Paula, as you can see, uh, I could have a cluster that has many or three data centers in this case, and clearly they have different capacity, storage capacity, and also used and free. Uh, but if you look at this particular data center, Northern California, you see very distributed or very even distribution of use capacity among the nodes comprising the DC. So let's kind of come back and let's, let's drill into, you know, so you get a good capacity view, you get a good view of the overall health of the system, you can diagnose if anything's going wrong in the system. Let's at this point actually jump straight into uh, looking at uh, the nodes in the system, the data centers and the nodes within the system. Right, so uh, as I said earlier, you have uh, data centers that have different numbers of nodes, right? And um, earlier uh, here is where I would add my node to grow my cluster uh, for that particular data center. And this is all the user has to do, right? You're keying in a host name and the IP address, you're keying in basically credentials access. We then push all of the node updates, we reconfigure it into the cluster, we rebalance the cluster on the fly. So all of that is done for you in the background. The other thing that I think, so let's, let's go into now actual use, right? So it's um, meant to be a, a system where you have a storage administrator. We've talked about policies. The storage administrator is able to control the policy and then it's able to be used by a user who's actually able to then do, use that appropriately. So the storage administrator is governing the data protection, the durability of it. So why don't we go and create a policy? Sure. So to do that, I, I'm a math user, by the way, guys. That's a slightly bit of a struggle here, but this is how you do it. Uh, <laughs> I've tortured you by giving you a Windows machine. To work. 
<laughs> so, so obviously the name matters, right? So you give it a name, you give it a very a good description, something that you would recognize as you pull out the names. And you have a choice of either creating a replication within a single data center uh, or erasure coding right within a single data center or replication across data centers where in this case I could easily create a storage policy that's passed by da data center so one copy can be in each data center and also I could do replication across data centers right um, over uh, erasure coded um, nodes or policies okay that's how you would do it and um, in, in this example um, I've chose to uh, or I'm gonna choose to create a replication across data centers with three replicas right and then I would choose my data my data center Norcal, Las Vegas and down here I could define uh, my uh, consistency level for data right I could customize that so that I can choose right a, a very either a very strong um, requirements or I could say just quorum so that in the event that uh, quorum meaning majority so that you have two of my data centers available then I will complete that operation either for reads or for writes And I think also of note there, you notice there was also metadata consistency. So we actually do that so that you can actually set different policies for how you want metadata replicated. This is, you know, very hands-on as a system administrator, as a storage administrator, they want to be able to govern this. They want to be able to govern how they want to replicate data. It's not how you want your users to act. They understand their data, but you want the users to be able to just now use these policies. So what's great about this is it's a one-time, uh, you know, you set up, the storage administrator set up their policies. And now we'll show you a user side of things, of them actually creating a bucket and how, what they can do. And then they can set their life cycle. They can select, of course, the policy that's associated for their particular data, what's relevant. And show, we'll show you that. Uh, so in this case, he's actually changed into Janet because we thought Janet was yes. kind of a fun name for Victor here. So we've got Janet, uh, the, the user. Uh, the My alter ego, right? OK. So first thing I could do at this point is create a bucket. And I could give it a name, of course. Yes. Bucket. And now I can select uh, my custom uh, storage policy to be associated to that um, bucket name. In this case, I'll just choose one. I'll pick on RAD or replication across data center. This is what I mean by earlier by providing a, a very good description. Kind of pulls that right here. Yeah, I can click create. And now I can load objects to that particular bucket. Uh, let me bring up the properties here. Oh. Yeah, feel for it. Okay, all right, so uh, this, are, this would be the, the place where I could define the lifecycle policy. I could easily do that by uh, clicking on enabling, enable tiering. And here I can specify either to tier to AWS or to Glacier. Okay, and I can also provide my credentials, right? Providing the access key and the secret key for that particular destination. Now I could also expire objects um, from this bucket by specifying the time that those buck those objects will expire, right? Now if I don't want that to happen, I may choose a replication. Right onto another uh, S3 endpoint. I could do that here. Again, Mac privileged. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how does that look if you do a query um, from um, 
using S3 to actually look at the lifecycle policy and list them. Because you're doing, you're doing it to a certain degree one way correctly, okay. and in another way you're sort of modifying that policy slightly. Mm -hmm. So, so if I did the query and said, "Show me the lifecycle policy," what would, it, what would it look like? Would it be similar? Would it be? Let me think. Gary, do you know? Let me take you back there. Um, sorry, I didn't quite follow. So, 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 so if I if I use the API mm -hmm. and I build a, build a call that says, "Show me the lifecycle policy," but I do that from an S3 API call. You're talking about the S3 bucket lifecycle API. Yeah. Yes. So, I'm, so I use the API to actually do a call and say, "Show me the bucket policy." Correct. Now, there's only limited settings within that, so That's I can right. only you know, do very little. You're sort of extending that slightly here. You're producing a subset. So what will I see back in that API? Will I see something that you've decided to code yourself? So, so right, so, so I, I understand. So, so th these, are, these are completely separate. So, so when you do the S3 bucket lifecycle calls, you'll get exactly this, what you expect as far as the S3 API. Okay. And this is a separate interface and a separate. So I won't be able to see if I query it through the REST API. I will not be able to see this information. Correct. Okay. Right. But have there we, are have uh, admin APIs that actually, again, if you want to completely automate this, yeah, there's a whole. It's a different API. It's an, we call them the admin API. You can call them and, right. and, and you'll get the same information. So let's watch watch time wise. So I think what you see is you know very easy capability. So that you know Janet here yeah. uh, can actually create <laughs> buckets very easily. Um, of course, it's all under control. They're not getting in there and they're not allowed to do things that are dangerous to the system side of things. They're, they're in control, they're doing it based on policy, but they can govern how they want to age their data. They understand the value of their data, so how they want to age their data, how they want to manage it in terms of life cycle, whether they want to tier it, all of that is possible for the users. So with that, we want to actually switch back to, uh, you know, how does the end user actually go and use this? So very quickly, I'd like to show uh, Actually, we may not have time. I'm, I'm just thinking time-wise, we may be a little tight on time. So we had another application that we were going to show you, which is actually a you know, full Veeam and Commvault actually using this service. We can probably show it to you guys later. But what's really nice is they just can use it as it looks exactly like a Commvault application. You can, do, uh, you can get back a single, you know, in Veeam, I can get back a single VM, and I can bring it up as a temporary VM and, and start it up. Um, and all of the stateful storage, the backup is on us. Uh, Commvault exactly the same way. All of the valuable dedupe that you get out of Commvault is still available to you. Uh, so you're getting this compressed deduped backup that gets fed into us, all because on the back end of it, they've already implemented coded S3. So Commvault, of course, uses coded S3. Veeam, we're using our HCF agent, which is our NFS uh, SMB connector. We're using that to actually connect in through the S3 store. So wealth of applications that we can support.